Okay, so welcome in the wonderful world of software. Hardware is very important, but what is hardware without a good software? Uh, it is around midnight in country uh, from I came from. Uh, so it's hard to think, it's hard to present, but I hope you will forgive me possible failings. Another thing characteristic to my country, our names and surnames very difficult to read. So uh, most people's minds blow up when they, saw, when they see so many consonants next to each other. Uh, so my name is Krzysztof Loska. I work in uh, R&D office, in Nordic's R&D office in Kraków, Poland. And Krzysztof is uh, equivalent for English name Christopher, so you can call me Chris. Okay, so agenda. Uh, first, I will tell a few words about SDK in general. What is it? Uh, then, about drivers present in SDK. I will present the general concept of, of them, how to configure them. A few, uh, I'm going to tell a few more words about transport drivers. And I, I'll give one example uh, which presents all the concept uh, in this section. After that, I'm going to present AND 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 plus in our SDK. And at the end, I think maybe the most interesting thing, and I said and I, I'm saying that not only because I'm personally involved in creating software for this, but NFC is a really cool thing, and you can do a lot of interesting things using it. Okay, so at the beginning, a few words about SDK in general. So what is SDK? It's just a collection of, uh, of code to make development easy for you. Uh, in this table, there, are, there is only a very small subset of different software components that we provide for you. Uh, we have a lot of drivers. I think that probably we have drivers for all peripherals present in NRF52. We have uh, general libraries like CRC, Hash, or a library for NFC. We have uh, software modules, which are more specialized, like AND common modules, like NFC and DEV protocol implementation, like diverse, uh, device firmware update. Uh, we have, of course, uh, application examples. Um, for hardware peripheral alone, for AND, AND BLE, for BLE. And of course, we have some externals. So you can find in our SDK soft devices in a hexadecimal form. You can find MDK, which are headers needed to access um, registers. And we also incorporated two RTOSs. So in uh, SDK, um, which you can download now, we have RTX. But in the upcoming SDK release, we will also add free RTOS. OK. Uh, which compilers and IDs we support. So we support three compilers, IR, KL, and GCC. And our reference IDE is KL. So all our examples are provided for KL, 
but most of them are also provided for IR and GCC. And we are not locked to any proprietary IDE. You can use whatever you want. And if you are interested in uh, developing for GCC, you can find some guidelines on the Nordic Developer Zone. So where to get all these wonderful things? Uh, very good information is that to get our SDK, you do not need any keys, any registration, or something like that. It used to be like that, that you have to provide some key from development key, from development kit, and so on. But now, only you have to do is to go to developer.nordicsemi.com, and there you can find zip. Or if you use uh, KL5 IDE, you can use uh, built-in pack installer and download directly from Kale our CMC SPACs. Uh, new thing is Info Center. So we moved all or almost all documentation to Info Center page. So when you, when you go to infocenter.nordicsemi.com, you'll find the documentation for soft devices, for SDK, many, uh, many white papers, and so on. And another important place is devzone.nordicsemi.com, uh, which is a forum and a blog. And it governs a big community of uh, engineers. So probably this site is the first place when you should go if you have any question of you or you look for, for some answer. Because mo many of the problems were already answered on this site. Our development kits. So of course, in the upcoming SDK and in the experimental SDK, that we released in June. We support development kit for NRF52. Uh, I have two of them here, and I'm going to show you very, two very interesting demos at the, at the end that joins together AND and NFC. We also support NRF51 development kit in our SDK, there won't be like two SDKs separate for 51 and for 52. There will be only one SDK for both. And we added support for Dynastream's N5 DK1 development kit, and it will be present in the upcoming SDK release. So why to use our SDK? Of course, to speed up development, we provide a lot of ready software. Uh, code is written by people with deep, deep knowledge of hardware. And we are in a direct connection with a hardware team. We are in a direct connection with a team developing soft devices. So of course, or at least we hope, we know uh, our solution the best. Uh, also, our technical support know, knows the product very well. So, for example, if you have any problem with uh, our peripheral driver, probably you are going to receive uh, some response from technical support much quicker if you use our, um, our driver than if you use your own. And as I mentioned, there is a great community about uh, around Nordic Developer Zone. Uh, a lot of people know our SDK. So if you have any problem, probably you receive an answer on Nordic, De Nordic Developer Zone. And we also have some more specialized SDKs that use our general SDK as a basis. So product-specific SDKs. 
Uh, some SDKs live their own life outside general SDK. And why is like this? So one answer is because maturity of them, um, they are not uh, mature enough to, to merge them into our SDK. Uh, many of the solutions are experimental. It's, for example, IoT SDK, which is SDK intended to add IPv6 over Bluetooth Smart and many other network layers above it, like HTTP, Co-op, MQTT, and so on. So for now, it's like more experimental solution. We have also some uh, solution uh, intended for wireless charging. It is the first one of these reasons SDK. And uh, the, the third one, uh, it is separate because uh, it requires a special licensing. So to use the third one, HomeKit SDK, you have to sign NDA with Apple. Okay, so now about SDK drivers. A general concept of, of our drivers is that we have uh, two layers. The first layer is whole, but it's not hardware abstraction layer. It is called hardware access layer. And it is a thin stateless layer to access peripheral registers. Um, so why, why we have this layer? Um, it is to make a dev a development of peripheral drivers easier. It is a thin layer. It means that in this layer, we do not store any states. All the functions are inlined. So it is not any overhead added using this layer. Because it's uh, stateless, there is no memory overhead. And because it is inlined, it is not overhead in time. And we use it, as I said, to make the development of drivers easier. So uh, we do not have to access uh, registers directly. So normally, when you want to set some flags, you have to shift, uh, shift some, uh, some flag. You have to probably make an OR and, or maybe end operation with another flag. It is very easy to make a mistake. Um, so we created like simple functions that are very clear and they are verified. So it is um, using, using them, it is not possible to make a mistake when you want to access some specific flag in a register. Uh, it is also useful when we want to handle some hardware anomalies. So when we know that we have to do some workarounds because we have uh, some anom anomaly in hardware, we have to, we can hide this in, into this layer. And then above it, we have peripheral drivers layer and this layer does not access registers direct, directly, uh, but of course it uses whole layer. It is uh, one driver for one peripheral, and very nice thing is that drivers have same API with and without soft device. So maybe you have sometimes a situation when you disable a soft device, but you still have to make uh, some operations uh, uh, using peripherals and it is the same API, the same functionality. It is all, all, uh, all is handled inside our drivers so you do not have to worry about it. And our drivers has internal state and they own peripheral interrupt. Mm. 
Another thing is that they can be statically and dynamically configured. And there is a one configuration header file for all peripherals. Also, we tried to find a balance between simplicity and functionality in drivers. So our drivers covers majority of peripheral features, features but of course not all. Uh, so there are two types of drivers. Uh, Multi-instance drivers like RTC or SPI. And if you want to use many instances, of course, you have to create them. And there are shared drivers like PPI, GPIoT or Clock. And those drivers are shared between many modules. So each module has, uh, must ensure that a driver is initialized and the uh, init function signals if, if driver is already initialized. And for this shared drivers, we only have static configuration. So you are not able to change any parameters in initialization. So what is static configuration? As I mentioned, there is a one file, one header file, which stores configuration for all drivers. Each peripheral has its own section and every peripheral must be enabled before it is used. In, in, it has to be enabled in this file. And you can use null config, you can use null as a parameter in the initialization function and then uh, configuration from this file is used. And dynamic configuration. So sometimes you just want to um, change only one parameter in initialization. It's uh, totally okay for you to use the default configuration from this static file, but you have a need to, uh, to tailor one particular functionality. So you can create a configuration structure uh, using, um, using parameters from, from static configuration and then you are able to, to change only some, some parameters and then you can provide a configuration, configuration uh, into initialization function. So, a few more words about transport drivers. Uh, there is no extra buffers in memory. We use only those supplied by an application. So, inside the driver, there is no any buffers for communication. And all of transport drivers support two modes of operation. A blocking mode, so a transfer function returns after transfer is done, and non-blocking mode. In non-blocking mode, transfer function returns immediately, uh, but after transfer end, um, um, event handler function is called, which was provided in initialization function. We have common NPI for legacy and EasyDMA equipped peripherals. And uh, type of peripheral used uh, is configured statically or dynamically. dynamically. And uh, I think if you are devel develop developers and you will be um, developing some software for NRF52, it is a very important information to remember that we have a limitation in NRF52. So for peripherals with EasyDMA, transmission is possible only from buffer located in data RAM. So when you 
Ja, legacy, legacy peripherals, legacy transport peripherals are not recommended, but for example, if you want to transfer some data from flash, in fact, you are not, you, you cannot use EasyDMA. So, yeah, you should remember because probably it will save you some hours of debugging. Uh, so, some examples. NRF their VSPI, it is a driver for SPI. You can configure frequency, SPI mode, bit order, and overrun character. Like any other transport driver, you can use it in blocking and non-blocking mode. You can configure MOSI and MISO pins. They can be configured or disconnected. And there is an automatic control of slave select pin, but here is this balance between functionality and simplicity. So this automatic control function is uh, implemented only for single slave. So if you have many slaves, you have to implement automatic control above provided driver. Uh, your driver, you can configure parity flow control, baud rate, uh, the same as other blocking and non-blocking mode. You can enable a RIX without buffer, but only for UART. And you can abort ongoing transfers. For TWI, which is equivalent for I, I square C, you can configure frequency, use them in both modes, and it is possible to select after transfer action if you want to suspend or stop. So a small example, uh, SPI driver in blocking mode. Of course, at the beginning, you have to create a driver instance and then initialize a configuration uh, structure. So we inherited uh, some default configuration from uh, configuration header file, but then we want to tailor some some functionality. And we provide uh, an instance and configuration into init function. As you see here, the third uh, parameter is null, and uh, the third parameter is this uh, event handler function. And because it is null, it means that it's going to work in blocking mode. So to perform a transfer, um, you have to call SPI transfer function, which does not return until transfer is done. And after it, you can call another, another transfer. As you see, uh, if we have only data to transmit, you can provide null uh, in receive buffer and the other way. If, if you're only interested in receiving, you provide a null in, in a transmit buffer. And when you do not need uh, to transfer something anymore, you can uninitialize. In non-blocking mode, it is uh, very similar. One thing is different. Uh, this third parameter in the function is a pointer to event handler. So when we start the transfer, uh, SPI transfer function returns automatically, but when transfer is done, event handler is called. Okay, a uh, few words about ANT and ANT plus in our SDK. It is our, I can say, old philosophy. It was used still SDK version 6.x. And till this version, we were very board centric. Uh, as you see, the main thing here is a board folder. 
in which is, in which is a board NRF6310 with many examples. Uh, then is another board with many examples. And it was very hard to maintain because we barely have any module. So it was a lot of copies of the same software between examples. It was very hard to add new boards. And of course, it was hard to, for customers to reuse our code because, as I said, it was not so many software modules. And since SDK 7.0, we introduced a completely new philosophy. And now we are component centric. And of course, it is much easier to maintain because the same module is reused in many examples. It is much easier to add new boards. And it is very easy for customers because you have some software components separated. So it's very easy to just incorporate it into your application. Uh, we also started to extract AND components. First extracted AND components were released in SDK 9.0, but it was uh, very few, few of them. But many new will come in the upcoming SDK release. And of course, we refactored all AND examples, and now they use common modules. And because we separated some software modules, now it was possible for us to write unit tests, and because of that, it is much better quality of them. And as you see, uh, we have a module to configure a channel, we have a module to configure encryption, a uh, key manager, uh, we have a module to configure search functionality in AND, to um, configure stack. So I think uh, many interesting things will come. We also refactored uh, AND profiles in the SDK. We, of course, do not have implemented all of profiles, uh, uh, which are uh, provided by, by Ant. We have a few examples in the SDK, uh, but profiles used to be a part of an, of an example application, and offer were not complete, not all pages were implemented. And now we extracted all profiles as a modules, so they are fully independent from an example application, and we implemented them completely. So here, for example, is a HRM profile implemented. As you see, every page has its own uh, C and H file. And it is an example of page zero. So, but the philosophy is the same for all pages and all profiles. So we abstracted things. For every page, we created a structure, add encode and decode function. So when you want to encode some information into page zero, you just have to fill a structure and provide it into encoder. And the same in the, in the direction when you want to decode things. And uh, in the upcoming SDK release, we are going to provide three new AND examples. The first one is AND scalable. Uh, as Liz today mentioned, and now it is possible to configure AND stack to have between one and 15 channels. So these examples, this example show, shows how to, how to make it in a very easy way using our extractant modules. Then we have AND scalable encrypted. Uh, it, is also, it also shows new functionality mentioned by Liz. So 
it used to be that you could encrypt only one ANT channel, but now you are able to encrypt up to 15. And this example uses also our extracted ANT, and, ANT uh, enc encryption module. And the third one is what was presented on high note count uh, um, workshop yesterday. And it is an scanned and forward example. OK, so NFC now. Uh, probably most or some of you are embedded developers. So you know that sometimes it is important to understand hardware to better understand software. So I'm going to give you uh, some basic explanation about NFC hardware to give you then a better overview of NFC software. In NFC, there are three modes of operation. Read-write mode, peer mode, and card emulation mode. And there are also two sides in NFC transmission. So NFC is not symmetric. It is always a polling device on the one end, which generates electromagnetic field. And it is a listening device on the other hand, on the other side, which modulates received electromagnetic field. In uh, card emulation mode, maybe from, from the end, on the one side, we have NFC forum device. So what is NFC forum device? It is a full functional device which has to support all NFC functionalities. So it is also important that there is no like one NFC. There is um, many standards, uh, many modes, and NFC is just a common name for, for them, but it is not like one single NFC solution. But NFC forum device has to be fully functional, so it, it, has, to be, um, it has to be able to work in all technologies. So mostly NFC forum device is a smartphone or a tablet, uh, because of course it is much more complicated than NFC forum tag. So in card emulation mode, on one end we have NFC forum device, and on the other hand we also have NFC forum device, but it emulates a tag. And uh, this mode is mostly used for payments. So when you use your smartphone to pay for something. And of course it is not possible to, to make it using an RF52. Other mode is a peer mode, when you have an RF forum device on both ends, and it is used for file sharing. So you have uh, two smartphones, you put them together, and they transfer some file. And of course, it is also not possible uh, using our device. And the third mode is read-write mode. So on the, one end, on the one end, you have an SC forum device, and on the listening side, you have NFC forum tag. And it is what we implemented into NRF52. So how it works? NFC operates in one of the ISM bands at 13.56 megahertz. Smartphone, which is NFC forum device, generates NFC field, and NFC tag detects these fields in, in close proximity, and it modulates, modulates it.
So key features of, of our NFC tag, which is embedded into NRF52. Our tag is based on NFC forum specification, so it is a standardized solution. We support NFC 8 listen mode uh, with data rate of 106 kilobits per second. And here is very important information. We can only be a tag, so we can only be a target, a listening device. And we cannot be an initiator. And it means that we are able to expose information, but we are not able to read information or write information into another tag. And uh, I have some tag here. I don't know if you, if you are familiar with tags, but maybe you have seen something like that. It's a sticker, which, which is a tag. So this one is uh, fully passive. So it's not any battery inside. It has only an antenna and a chip. And it is powered by a field provided by uh, by a polling device. And it, of course, modulates this field to be able to respond. Uh, what is very nice in our TAC is a system wake, wake on field function. I will tell something more later about this. Uh, our TAC solution does not have its own memory. So memory has to be provided as a buffer in RAM, but we have an easy DMA connected with it, so it's a very low power solution. And in the last point, an important information is that we implemented many features into hardware. So for example, automatic collision resolution algorithm it is uh, very often implemented into software, but it has a very strict timing requirements. Uh, so it's for sure it's not a low power solution when it is implemented into software, but we put it into hardware. We have a configurable frame assembler, the assembler, which includes CRC and parity calculation. We have interframe timer, so our tag solution is very low power because we put a lot of functionalities into hardware. But it's also worth to, to know what we do not support. So, as I mentioned, we cannot be NFC reader, so we are not, we cannot be on the polling side. We support only NFC A, uh, so we do not support NFC B and NFC F. We cannot be powered by field, and it is not possible to charge our device using uh, external NFC field. But what we have is just enough to implement uh, very nice functionalities and use cases. And maybe a little bit more about hardware. Uh, we have uh, three modes of operation. Uh, in disable, everything is off, so it doesn't take any, any, any power. In sense mode, and this is very important, this is this wake on field functionality. Because sense mode is functional in system on, but also in system off. And it detects if there is a field present. And it adds only 100 nanoamps current consumption. So this wake on field functionality, it, wakes, it works exactly the same as a reset button. So you can go to system off and you can wake your device by providing an NFC field. 
And in activated uh, state, we are able to receive and transmit frames, and typically it adds about 400 microamps. So software for NFC. We provide NFCA library, which supports type to tag as a driver. It is not a soft device, but it is like a very complicated driver, which is part of SDK. Uh, present NFCA library supports read-only state, which is exactly what is needed for out-of-band pairing and most other functionalities. Uh, we support read-only state for now, but it is only software limitation. Hardware allows to read a tag, to write a tag, but our um, NFC library supports read-only state. But as I mentioned, it is enough for most functionalities. And we are adding more layers on top of NFC library in, F, in, in SDK. Uh, it is uh, NFC NDEF message format, connection handover record, application launch record, and URI record. So a few more words about that. What is NFC NDEF? NFC NDEF is a standardized uh, data format that can be used to exchange information between NFC devices. So, in simple words, it just defines how NFC messages should look like. It is uh, like any other frame in any wireless protocol. And uh, general implementation of it will be a part of the upcoming SDK release. And uh, very nice thing about that is that in one NFC message, you, you can have many NFC records. And it gives you a lot of possibilities. So some use cases. How you can use our NFC. This one I already mentioned. Uh, many wearables products do not have any keypads or buttons. And you can use NFC to implement this wake on field functionality. You can uh, put your sensor, your wearable into sleep, and then you just touch smartphone with NFC enabled, and it wakes up automatically from system off. Another thing are NFC records. Uh, a nice thing about records is that a lot of records are automatically or natively supported by OSs. So you do not need any additional application to be able to parse NFC record and use information which are provided. All of operating systems do it automatically for many records. So one application record, uh, one uh, example record is a application launch record. So reading attack launches already installed application or downloads this application from the store if, uh, if those application is not already installed. Uh, this scenario is not standardized by NFC forum, but it is standardized and natively supported by OSS providers. So, as I mentioned, no additional application is needed on the mobile side. And because you can put many records into one NFC message, you can create an NFC message which contains NFC launch application record for Android and NFC launch application record for Windows. And this solution 
works on both OSs. So uh, I have a demo of that. Oh, probably it's too small to to be visible for all of you. But after my presentation, you can come and try yourself. So I have a Samsung Galaxy S6 smartphone. It has support for both technologies, NFC and AND. And here I have our newest SDK, our newest uh, development kit, which has NRF52. And here is uh, NFC antenna. So uh, I created uh, an uh, application example, which is uh, which implements HRM profile and uh, HRM profile in transmit mode, and I also added application launch record. So when I when I touch a uh, smartphone to NFC antenna, smartphone received NFC record and automatically launched ant plus hertz uh, rate graph application. So now I can search for device, select it, and it works. So it's a much better user experience because application, which is intended for your hardware, launches automatically. And as, as it says, if it's not installed, it directs you to Google Store and you, you are able to activate application in a very easy way. Another one is a URI record. And it is a record which provides you, uh, for example, URL. So reading a tag launches a default web browser with provided URI. And uh, this scenario is standardized by NFC forum and natively, and natively supported by OSS providers. So you do not need any additional application on the mobile site to support it. And you could use this functionality, for example, to provide a quick start guide or some manual for your device. So user, um, user buys your device and then just touch a device with a smartphone and a manual or maybe your website pops up automatically. So I have uh, another demo of that. Uh, I think in this one. So here uh, I programmed URI NFC record with Nordic Semi URL inside. So when I put it here, as you see, browser launches automatically with www.nordicsemi.com address. Is that cool or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the sad, sad thing is that Apple devices do not support reading tags. They have a hardware for it, but I don't know, maybe some political reasons, strategical reasons, I don't know, but uh, they do not support reading tags. 
but maybe it's, I hope it will change in the future. And uh, the fourth and last use case for NFC is NFC pairing. So NFC can simplify the process or authenticate pairing between two devices by exchanging authentication information over NFC link. So why we think that NFC pairing is a great option for wearables and IoT devices? Because it is very intuitive. So to pair two devices, you just have to touch and it's all. It's uh, secure due to proximity demand. So for example, in this pairing NFC message, you can provide a key for, a, for encryption. And why it is secure option? Because a range of NFC is only one centimeter. So it's not possible to eavesdrop this key. Or maybe it's very, very hard. There is no requirement for any user interface features on, the, on a product, and it is much simpler than normal pairing. So how it could be implemented, or how it is implemented in general? Uh, handover requester, which is a polar device, sends a request to read a tag, and then tax just exposes its memory and it responses with uh, what, what is called handover select record. And in this record, there are information needed for pairing. And then pairing is done on a general communication module and data are exchanged. So it is very user-friendly functionality because it provides all the information that are needed for pairing over NFC channel. So how it could be implemented for ANT? It is a connection handover standard, which is standardized by NFC forum, and it describes a general protocol independent method to activate a wireless protocol alternative to NFC. So uh, this specification is a general one, but for your wireless protocol, you have to specify your standard on top of, of, of it. So it is already specified for classic Bluetooth, for Bluetooth low energy. It is specified for Wi-Fi. And I think it could be great if it would be specified for ANT. But of course, uh, creating such a standard uh, requires a cooperation between and Alliance and NFC Forum. Uh, but the advantage of it is that it is a standardized solution that could be natively supported by mobile OSs. But of course, it is a simpler solution or maybe quicker. Uh, you can implement it on your own. So on the firmware side, you have to create a proprietary pairing record containing pairing informations. And, but on the mobile side, it won't be natively supported by operating system. So you have to do some work um, implementing additional functionality in your mobile application. So your, your application on the mobile side should work in background filtering and taking over your proprietary pairing record, and then it should parse the record 
use information provided and using Unstack API on mobile OS, it should pair. Okay, so it was like last slide about NFC and software for NF52. And I want to encourage you to take part in our global tech tour. We gave you very short and quick introduction in, into NRF52, but during our global tech tour, it will be a whole day event. So we are in those places in the United States. So as you see on the east and west side and in the middle, we are in Europe, in a few places, and we are in many, many places in Asia. So thank you for your time, uh, if you have any questions. And of course, uh, if you have a phone with NFC or you can use my phone, you are welcome to uh, try our demos.